for some of us at Notre Dame to have this event here. And I was going to welcome you to the campus, and as this day has worn on, I realized how much I'm welcoming many of you back to this campus, like Virgil Exner, Jr. The Exner name is an important name here in the history of the design program at Notre Dame, and we recognize that. And it is part of the pleasure of this evening is being able to acknowledge that uh, to Virgil and to the uh, assembled crowd. I also want to, uh, to welcome you on behalf not just of the Department of Art, Art History and Design, but of the Snipe Museum of Art, which is one of the co-sponsors of this event. I understand also that the Studebaker Museum here in town has been instrumental in this. And there are also good friends of Notre Dame and of the Snipe, people like Charlie Hayes, who have played a role in this evening, and I want to thank all of them. Now my comments this morning, are, or this evening, are very short. It's simply to say thanks to people to welcome you back, and then to turn the podium over to Paul Down, who will introduce the evening's program. So, thank you. And I, and I thank him for that, and I, and I uh, happily 
welcome him to our university and proudly present him to you this evening, Peter Grist. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. If this place looks like sheer terror, it's because it is. Ladies and gentlemen, honoured guests, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Uh, for those in the audience that can't understand my accent, I can give out copies of this speech afterwards. And yes, I might be asking questions at the end. <laughs> um, uh, if you have any questions, I know it's probably odd, but if you have any questions, uh, put your hands up, I can see you, and do interrupt to me because I do like being interrupted. So I do, I do mean that. Um, my interest in votes later now. My interest in Virgil Action and his designs stretched back many years to when I was a young teenager in the, 19, in the 1980s listening to 1950s rock and roll music. Um, the cars that fit that era best were the, uh, uh, the cars from the Chrysler Corporation, the thin, the thin beauties from there. Over the years, once fashions and tastes changed, hair gets a little bit thinner. Um, but my love for his work has never, ever uh, changed at all. <coughs> there we go. Technically. Today I still only drive Chrysler Corporation cars, actually. I am admittedly obsessed. I don't know if you guys are the same in the U over here as in the UK, but um, Chrysler owners do tend to stick together. Um, um, we have kind of a little, get, uh, little greeting when we meet each other. Uh, we have a special wave, really. Uh, Porsche owners tend to salute. Uh, BMW double drivers tend to uh, flash their headlights. And uh, Jeep owners hop their horns. And uh, us Chrysler owners, we wave our toolboxes at each other. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chrysler. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately for X now, he is remembered really for those Buffin powerhouse cars from the 50s that, that rolled around those cruised around the streets of America so long ago. But the man was so much more than a one horse trick. From very early on in his life, Virgil Exner had a strong sense of what an automobile should look like. It sounds almost silly to say now, but uh, first and foremost, he thought that a car had to do, it had to look like a car, it had to do the job. It, it couldn't look like a rocket ship, it had to look like a car first and foremost. And his belief that form should follow function was seen in much of his work, whether it be cars, boats, or any of the designs that he worked on. Being a member of various organisations, like the SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers, or the American Society of Body Engineers, he had the opportunity to give talks to those bodies, and always tried to discourage uh, the Buck Rogers style, as he called it, of School of Design. This can be seen in some of his earliest works, as in the front grille front grill of this Pontiac design from 1938. Beautifully designed, but first and foremost practical, directing air to exactly where it needs to be for car brushing and cooling. The first car that Exner had entire responsibility for was the 1938 Pontiac, a smooth design that he felt justly proud of although the mechanics of the car failed to meet its high expectations. And he worked with and learned from some of the greatest names in the business. Harley Earp, Raymond Lowy, Eugene Gregory, Richard Teague, to name just a few. But none of these guys gave Exner his vision of the future. That was as much a part of him as his wavy hair and inherent good looks. By the time he'd left General Motors to work for Raymond Lowy in the Studebaker account in 1939, he had already an enviable reputation for high quality work and progressive design. Creating what people wanted to see in automobiles in the next two or three years, not 20 years into the future. Woolwork interrupted his automotive designing, but did give him the opportunity to create a very practical military equipment. The most successful, which was the M29 Weasel, and the fully amphibious M29C. The Weasel, um, was reported to be the first vehicle to land on Omaha Beach in 1944. So there you go. And 
And then more work uh, was always um, under heavy time schedules, but they actually gave, the World Bank gave Studebaker 180 days to make this thing. And um, on the first day, uh, they started designing. On the 60th day, the prototype was working. So that's some accomplishment, I think. The car design was never far from his thoughts. It was, plans, it was his plans for the first post-war car that caused his famous falling out with Lowy. In early 1943, he started working on a groundbreaking design that would eventually set the design premises for almost every car, every modern car, that we see around today. In fairness to Exner, he was drawn into corporate politics without his knowing. Chief Engineer Studebaker Roy Cole disliked the flamboyant Lowy and felt that the car company wasn't getting value for money from the New York design company. Exner also liked, uh, disliked Lowy's habit of taking credit for other people's designs, so he was easily persuaded by Cole to create an alternative design for the first post-war car, different from ones that the South Bend based design group were working on. With the Studebaker president Harold Vance's blessing and in complete secrecy, Exner worked at home in spare time creating a car within the specifications fixed by Cole. He very quickly found out that it was going to be almost impossible to do, uh, to make a, um, uh, a, an attractive um, car, really, uh, that would um, set into those parameters. So he spoke with Cole and persuaded him to give a few inches here and a few inches there uh, on the wheelbase and the overall length um, and the width. But Oddly enough, neither Cole or Exner <coughs> deemed it necessary to tell the other guys from the lower game the changes. Um, so, this picture taken in 1943 was Exner's initial design for the first size <coughs> contrast play model. When the time came to unveil the design for the all new post war Studebaker, <coughs> Exner unveiled his alternative at the same meeting. Studebaker bosses preferred Exner's, understandably, to the lower gangs. And the design became the 1947 Champion Starlight Coupe. And you saw today the 49 version in the hall. Lowy, who was also attended the meeting, was obviously absolutely furious, at least behind the scenes shenanigans, and immediately fired Exner. Roy Cole anticipated this and immediately hired Exner. <laughs> but Lowy, true to form, took the credit for the car. From then on, Exner worked in tandem and almost a competition with the lower game until his time until his time as Studio Baker was over. By nineteen forty nine, Cole, the engineer, was thinking about retiring from retiring from Studio Baker and he couldn't guarantee Exner's uh, security anymore. So it was Cole that instigated the search for a new position for the designer. After unsuccessful talks with Ford, Cole approached Chrysler, who at that time was struggling with sales to uninspiring designs. It was a match made in heaven. As a fellow engineer, Cole knew James Zeder, young brother of Fred Zeder, and an engineer of Chrysler. Zeder, in turn, spoke to Chrysler President Katie Keller, in turn, uh, sorry, um, telling him that, that Exner was available. And after the briefest of meetings, Exner was hired. X was set up in his own design office, in solitary confinement, as he put it, working on advanced designs for the corporation. He was joined shortly after by a small team of designers, clay modellers and illustrators. And over the next few years, they worked on a series of idea or dream cars, as they're called nowadays, built mainly in conjunction with Gear of Turin. Amongst these were the K310, the Adventurer, the Chrysler Specials and the Dialogist, again, named just a few. So successful were his early concept cars that by 1953, Exner had been given responsibility for designing production cars too. <coughs> the Sporty Falcon was Exner's response to the Corvette and Thunderbird, although it sadly never saw production. This was one of um, his favourite designs, and a car that he used for his own personal transportation. And he actually used to uh, do time trials and racing. This was released at the same time as the two flights with cars, a soft top and a hard top. 
and these were more prophetic in appearance and carried many of the styling cues seen on the later cars. But it was the continuing partnership with Gear that led to the now legendary forward look cars of the mid to late 50s. The partnership and strong personal friendship between Exner and Luigi Segre, head of Gear, is well documented and was the catalyst for those designs. Segre was interested in aerodynamics relating to automobiles and employed an Italian aerodynamicist by the name of Giovanni Savanucci. And it was Savanucci that carried out wind tests that stem from the simple act of blowing ink across uh, a sheet of paper. The dark shape that occurred led to him creating a dark shaped car body for wind tunnel testing, which would eventually go and lead on to be the acclaimed gear gilder, which was actually unpowered. You can actually probably see from that picture it's actually on stilts, but it was, it was always a mock up, it was never powered, and it, it was repainted and used it up until 1965. But the main thing was that um, the Gear Gilder and the work with Zavanucci uh, inspired Exner to think about developing the idea of, uh, for production vehicles. And it is true to say that Her Harley Earl placed the first tentative rounded fins on the 1949 Cadillac. But these small fins were purely aesthetic and had no practical use. Exner's larger, more pointed fins were thought to increase stability at highway speeds. And as the decade of the 50s wore on, he pursued the idea of streamlining and aerodynamics. Between himself and Savanucci, they came up with a series of idea cars that culminated with a dark concept car. A truly inspirational vehicle that imbued everything that Exodus Forward Look stood for. In its first of three incarnations, the car debuted at the Turing Motor Show of 1957 to great acclaim. The low, jet like body featured underbelly streamlining with as few protrusions as possible. The fuselage was obviously dark shaped and featured a fully retractable metal hardtop that slid back into the trunk and an aerodynamic wraparound bumper that encompassed the whole car so the bumper you can see there, the chrome bit was in fact a bumper that went entirely round back to front and the other side after it finished testing in America the car returned to Turin where gear removed the hardtop and fitted a convertible soft top the car was shown at the 1958 Turin Motor Show <coughs> as the Dart II before again returning to gear to have its fin shaped and repainted and then renamed the Diablo, which is how it is today in this form. Following on from the dark were several more gear built concept cars that still survive today, notably the Chrysler 375 in 1957. And I don't know if any of you guys know about this, but it was found in, this car was found in a junkyard about four or five years ago by, I hope, a collector and then just disappeared. So hopefully someone out there has got it and hopefully they're doing it up. But it was on its way to be crushed. That's incredible. And following on from that, in 1958, was the 400, which you can see is very, very much like the dark. The yellow, the yellow and black car had the dark body, but with an immovable vinyl covered steel roof, and was a fully engineered prototype. And it's thought that uh, Gene Cattle from Jewel Motors bought the car and rebased it as a jewel for use as a pre production model. The dual gears that did go into production shared no similarities though with the Dart or the Chrysler 400. So from my ideas seen on this and other concept cars, the first tentative fins were introduced onto the Chrysler Corporation's groundbreaking production cars in 1955, when some Chryslers wore chrome fins that doubled as rear light bezels. <coughs> they were an important test to see how the public would react. <coughs> Feedback to those fins was very positive, and the 1956 cars debuted with more pronounced built-in fins, and were very successful. But it was the cars of the 1957 that astounded everyone. The beautiful, low, sleek powerhouse cars that took the automotive world by storm. But the thing is, these cars um, were released a year early. Exeter had always planned for them to be released in 1958. So they went into production under tested and under engineered. Under -engineered. In his defence, Exeter was not responsible for this decision and was recovering from his heart attack uh, when it was made. When he found out that they were going to uh, bring in the swept wing, swept wing, as it was called, in a year early, he argued against it, but obviously he failed. And the cars became a victim of their own success. But they were a huge sales success 
and Chrysler couldn't build them fast enough. But because of this, quality control fell by the wayside. An early car suffered from poor fit and finish, causing knocks, squeaks and leaks. The sharp retort of torsion bar snapping became an almost common sound for the roads of America. <laughs> yes, he recognised that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But the corporation did move very quickly to address the, uh, the thousands of complaints that they received. But unfortunately, the damage had been done. So the spectre of early rusting haunted Chrysler for many years after. So yes, they were born prematurely and had teething problems, but still they were tremendous cars. Their styling alone could scare the pants off the competition and cause GM in particular to rethink their plan styling for the next three years. Clever use of... Sorry. Clever use of trimming, accentuating and helped in the application of bright two-tone and three-tone paint schemes. The low stance complemented the sharp, dark-like look of the car. And this was a huge technical achievement for the engineers. Exner had requested um, that the new range should sit at least five inches lower than the 55 and 56 cars. And the Chrysler engineers claimed this to be an impossible task. But luckily, Chief Engineer Harry Chesborough was on Exner's side and he shared his vision. Struggling to find every inch, engineers came up with a range of modifications that helped, including the introduction of 14-inch wheels, lower air filters, a different roof lining, and of course the torsion bar suspension, which also had a dramatic effect on the handling of these cars when they were. Not only did they look fantastic, they actually handled better than any other North American built car of that era. Added to this, the introduction of Chrysler's superb new three-speed torque flight automatic transmission, <coughs> with a push button operation, made it to a Hemi V8 engine, and you've got an unbeatable package. And what is today considered by many is Chrysler Corporation's finest hour. Each mark had um, its own interpretation of the forward look, either designed by Exner or o overseen by him. Imperial, a division of its own between 1955 and 1975, and Chrysler's showcase luxury line wore the most of Exeter's design cues, as have been the case since 1955. A more sculptured body featured radius wheel arches to show off the wheels, a trash can trunk lid, and the chrome collar rear lights, which are some of the ideas that made it onto the production vehicles, and made them so distinctive. The 1955, not sorry, the 1957 Imperial was also the first ever production vehicles to use curved side glass as standard, and can complement the compound curved windscreens that wrapped around and over and across the roof. Chrysler Division again offered luxury and power in the next rung of the pricing ladder and epitomised what the forward look was about. Clean, simple dark shaped lines gave the car a look of motion even while at rest and the slightly raised rear end giving the car a perky, one reverent uh, attitude, flicking its tail to its competitors. New Chrysler's entered with a Windsor and made use of two-tone styling on their rear flanks. The Saratoga made a return after some five years' absence to take up the middle of the price spot and featured more luxurious colour-coded upholstery and a more powerful V8 engine. And the New Yorker and the 300C were the most expensive offerings from Chrysler's division and offered luxury and extreme performance. I hope you all had, all had time today to have a look at that beautiful 1957 300 in the hall earlier. It's undoubtedly, undoubtedly a beautiful car, but also a very important car. The 300C perhaps was the defining incarnation of everything that was good about the forward look. Never before had such a car received such technical and styling autonomy. And its development from model number 613 is well documented, but the 57 300C didn't have to share parts with any other car. Its grille was unique and not borrowed from a sibling. Minimal ornamentation complemented the stylish body surfaces and power from the Hemi V8 and handling from the dorsal torsion bar suspension could not be matched by any other similar car in the world. Exner's functionalistic lines helped the 300C win the Industrial <coughs> Designers Institute's Award for Excellence in Automotive Design, the car itself becoming an ageless classic. De Soto's, my favourite. Now came in four series. The new Dodge Base 5 suite, the larger 5-dome, 
then fine flight and sporty adventure. Audrey Soto's wore the now iconic triple stack rear tail lights and the neat but very impractical exhaust vents that exited through the rear bumper. And if you ever talk to a Soto owner about the rear vents, they rust like hell. <laughs> Terrible. But they look fantastic. <coughs> Undoubtedly, though, Dodge kept the most flamboyant styling for all of the corporation's offerings in 1957. The front grille featured a gullwing shaped horizontal bar which dipped in the centre and had a large Dodge crest. As with all of the 57 models, they had the deeply recessed headlights covered by the large eyebrows designed by Howard Pilkey from the Plymouth studio. But it was the unusual trim of the rear fins that made Dodge so distinctive. Substantial chrome strips started just under halfway along the car and curved up to separate the top part of the rear fender, giving the impression of an almost separately mounted fin. But by far Chrysler's basic, biggest success was their entry level model Plymouth. Which is not that one. There we go. The simple beauty of this car was undeniable. An advertising at the time shouted, Suddenly it's 1960! <laughs> Three years ahead, the only car that dares to break the time barrier. And the buying public obviously agreed, because they sold over three quarters of a million, million in 1957. And it was enough to knock Buick off of the traditional third spot in the, uh, in the ratings. Each division had a great year in 1957, but for the corporation it was a tremendous year. Sales reached well over a million, and Chrysler had 18.3% of the total passenger car market. In recognition, X became the very first vice president of design, a post that was actually uh, created for him. This was perhaps Exner's finest hour, but far from his only high point. The facelift models that followed are regarded today as classics. He also went on to create the very successful Valiant that even today can be found uh, driving around as taxis in some countries. Bulletproof cars. And the ill fated S series from 1962, which included the Plymouth Super Sport. After leaving Chrysler, he designed an amazing array of award-winning powerboats and cars like the Stubbs that still stand the test of time some 35 years after his untimely death in 1975. While recovering from surgery in the early 70s, a fellow patient and ex-Chrysler designer asked Virgil what he thought his greatest achievement had been up to that time. And Exton was very positive about his answer. He was most proud of reorganising the design department at Chrysler into a recognised and respected part of the organisation, a legacy which is still very much present today. And I feel sure that were he alive today, he would be very proud of the cars that Chrysler were building. They're stylish, sculptured, and aerodynamic bodies with minimal ornamentation. When it was first suggested to me that I should write Exton's biography, I was actually quite amazed that it hadn't been done already. I just assumed that there had been loads of books about the guy. So I, I jumped at the chance, basically. I accepted the challenge easily. My hope is that I've told his story in an unpretentious and almost conversational way. It's taken since 2003 to get to this moment in time, and I hope after reading the book that you agree it's well worth the wait. My immense thanks to Notre Dame and Virgil and Janet Exner for helping to put on this special day. To the owners of the beautiful concept and production cars for their support. Brian Rosenbush in particular, manager of Chrysler's historical collection, for doing such a fantastic job with those cars and for supporting this event. The Studebaker Baker Museum and to all the owners clubs and individuals that helped with the book and today's celebrations of Virgil and his work. And to MBI and Veloce for bringing this book to fruition. Thank you all. Let's just finish by saying that we live in a world that wallows in mediocrity and blandness. So most of all, I'd like to thank Virgil Exner Senior for creating such masterpieces of automotive art that still captivate and inspire. And to commemorate this, his time at Notre Dame, I'd like to present pull down the plaque, please. Paul, come up.
this day came about because um, when I was researching the book, I contacted his old school, Buchanan High School in Michigan, and through no fault of their own, they'd never heard of him. Um, which I thought was terrible. And so I offered to um, come over here uh, and to present them with a plaque um, for their school to commemorate that he'd been there. Um, which they liked the idea. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if some of the kids could see some of the cars too? And they thought that was a good idea too. So um, we started to organise this day, and then it comes snowboard and snowboard, and it turned into this fantastic event. And because of that, I'd like to um, invite um, two people from Buchanan High School to come up, Sherry Stein and Mary Jo Prosser, please, for a plaque, the original plaque that was this day kicked off with. So please.
He truly believed in aerodynamic car design, as had been demonstrated in the middle 30s by European automobile companies, not just Finns, for Finns newness sake. He had the talent, work ethic, and guts to stand up for good design, not just saleable <coughs> art. While Father was mostly praised for his Chrysler concept and production designs, he deeply believed in small car of the future as becoming the primary means for people to get from point A to point B, but always in a design that looked purposeful, swift, and embraced simple sculptural integrity that possessed actual integrity. He also would applaud many of today's design efforts. I also know that he would give enormous credit for his own success to the many excellent designers, modelers, engineers, and marketeers that surrounded him. We presented these images today at the Stepin Center, uh, but some of you may not have seen them, and so we're repeating them here now. Today, the designer is faced with more socio-economic concerns that must be considered <coughs> to interface with his or her creative ability. Today's social concerns are greatly related to energy resources, to our environment, job procurement, and education. As usual, all are fraught with divisive and factional politics. And that problem may only be addressed by sensible voting in a free democratic society. I believe a designer should not only dream up pretty pictures, but contribute greatly to alleviate all of those concerns. Thus, designers must not hide behind a facade of purism of design, of design art but face the reality of commercialism that exists in a free enterprise, free market world. They must absorb all of the latest engineering technology, manufacturing, marketing, and human factors, including psychological factors, that go into any product design. Virtually every human product made is touched by a designer's input from soap to a dentist chair to every automobile. America should have all of the automotive products that Europe and Asia now have and very few of what we use now here. They have every type of vehicle, including all of the gadgets, but for the most part are scaled down and are implemented by mass transit systems that we have given up in favor of the freedom to drive more irresponsibly than ever before. Americans do not understand that the American automotive industry is deeply involved in all of the world's markets, just as Europe and Asia is involved in ours. Detroit is well aware of this and will respond to Americans' expectations in well-balanced product offerings. However, Americans involved in car design need to be more aware of the lead on the part of the rest of the world that they should equal. Americans in general lack the deep cultural background and art appreciation that nearly all other world nationalities assume. Americans are particularly lacking in art education and therefore the understanding of basic design principles. They assume that anything goes rather than that there is good art and bad art just as there is good engineering and bad engineering. Good design is the basic prescription, common, to all intelligent human works, and it can be taught and learned.
today's and future designers must push the envelope to ensure that all of the world's potential energy resources are thoroughly considered. All, not just <coughs> drain alcohol or today's oil or atomic energy, wind energy, every single form must be considered to be able to replace the, the, uh, the dependency that we now have on, on oil. The University of Notre Dame and many other highly ranked universities should pursue more cross-breeding of its students between its colleges to genuinely ensure a well-rounded graduate. That graduate must also have been introduced to the work ethic in the real world, not just theory in an effort to teach the student how to go about thinking. Virtual reality in the computer world far as fall, fall, falls far short of the needs to touch, smell, hear, and take advantage of human instinctiveness and heartfelt compassion. The computer is only a tool, one of the many, that it takes to really produce. I believe that the same is true for market surveys that offer only vanilla without chocolate and strawberry besides. I have observed firsthand some of those weak surveys. Customers don't know what they really want until they can walk up to a new offering and read the sticker price. The true reality of talent <coughs> is that dreaming may be 2% or less of a designer's ability. Sleep, 20% or less. And the rest, just plain hard work. Without inventiveness, resourcefulness, and enthusiastic dedication, designers may just as well sleep all the time. Correctly, nurture creativeness on the part of higher education faculty with the same qualities can give many the opportunity to contribute to this country's prosperity and the world's in all product design now and for the future. Now I'd like to hear your comments or any questions you may have. Uh, I'm very interested in what you think and thought of uh, my father's career and uh, any uh, uh, design problems that he faced or, uh, or questions you'd like answered about how we go about designing cars or any product and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the method that was developed in effect uh, in the uh, uh, late 30s, uh, mid to late 30s, of, uh, of uh, the method that was truly invented by Americans uh, to uh, lead uh, the automobile industry in design in the world at that time, uh, the methodology that we go about and basically use today. Uh, first of all, do you have any questions about his career, in effect, and uh, his beginnings and uh, his endings, or anything else. Please. I have a two-part question, I suppose. One, just a general question, on your father's design philosophy, because yeah. it, there seems to be a contradiction because he was mm -hmm. so well known with the jet age style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. But at the same time, he brought back a lot of retro, the yeah. freestanding headlights. Mm -hmm. And then the author mentioned the form follows function, which right. seems to be a third side. How yeah. do these three things balance? Well, it was simple. Uh, when he grew up, uh, he fell in love with the cars at the times and the most powerful and, uh, and advanced, uh, which were Duesenbergs and Stutzes. And, uh, and that evolved into the... Uh, Car for America, uh, which he hot rodded, uh, uh, Model T Ford and uh, Model A Ford Roadster. That was, those were the cars he could afford, but he always loved the long hood, large wheeled uh, basic vehicles. But he knew better 
uh, himself as far as what he wanted to get America or any other country into was truly advanced uh, styling that he himself uh, believed in from automobile racing. They truly led, led the way as they do today in virtually every mechanical advancement and aerodynamic advancement that there is and that goes far beyond just the cars themselves it's the, it'll be the future of the highways that we have as far as crash walls are concerned and barriers and the control of uh, design of, of traffic uh, until we get to the point where we no longer need to drive uh, so uh, he uh, recognized that he loved racing cars and uh, soon began to uh, uh, design uh, smoother, uh, more aerodynamic cars uh, with that kind of a background and gave up for a while at least uh, his, um, uh, his uh, uh, effort to, on the, uh, uh, on the go, to go back to, you might say, the retro cars that have come into being. Uh, that he himself started the trend toward with a long hood, short, short deck uh, look uh, that uh, Mustang had picked up and that he was striving for with the Valiant uh, and with those cars as well as smaller cars. And uh, then uh, when, which influenced the industry tremendously as far as uh, the grills that we started to return to back in the uh, uh, early 1980s, uh, late 70s, uh, actually early 70s. And uh, I was part of that myself. Uh, but uh, then, uh, with various uh, crises that come along uh, from time to time, uh, you have to get back to basics. And uh, I think that he would appreciate today's car evolution, but he would certainly um, uh, uh, criticize uh, a lot of the vehicles that we have today from purely a identity standpoint. And he would still very much stand for real true aerodynamics, uh, not just the fins. That was done for stability uh, from crosswind direction more than anything else. It also lifted up the tail of the car to look more fleet. But he truly believed in raising the deck of it, as we have on stock car racing cars today, uh, to actually improve the aerodynamic drag uh, that. Uh, automobiles have become now associated with. I've had a lot of wind tunnel testing myself, and he did too, uh, from the 47 Studebaker in the, in the wind tunnel at uh, University of Michigan uh, in uh, 1945, before the car was introduced. So he was uh, both ways, a romantic always. Uh, he loved uh, the war of uh, the West, um, sinking ships, uh, and uh, and uh, gunslingers and uh, romantic novels and always the romanticists and his paintings show that more than anything else. He was an extremely skilled fine artist, and um, that uh, he was not able to take back up until uh, he uh, after he uh, uh, after we were in business ourselves uh, together. And uh, finally, uh, uh, he was uh, virtually retired to the point of doing nothing else but fine artwork. And uh, any other questions? Does that answer your question? Somewhat, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the other act, what I was going to ask, uh, mm -hmm. one, one design I was curious about is usually attributed to his successor, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, no, what Engel, is. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, the turbine car? But if you look oh, at the rear of that car, there's yeah. there's quite a bit of Exner in that car. How much of that was in the works when your father left? How much of that? Quite a bit of it was in the works, uh, but uh, he uh, a pretty well abhorred that design. Uh, it was a uh, rocket ship to him, and uh, it didn't uh, look like a, a real uh, uh, advanced design at all, and. Uh, and, uh, but uh, he had very little to do with it, except for the fact that he brought Giovanni Savanuzzi, uh, who had worked with Pia as a great, not only stylist, but engineer, fabulous uh, engineer, who had uh, done racing seaplanes for Fiat, 
uh, in the uh, mid-30s and uh, knew an enormous amount about aerodynamics and my father brought him to Chrysler uh, directly from Gia. The Shabonuses lived in, uh, in Royal Oak, Michigan for a number of years and he totally, Shabonuzzi, redesigned the Chrysler turbine, the turbine engine program because to him they had it all screwed up and, uh, and, uh, and he managed to do the uh, turbine engine that was tested in the 50 or 60 cars that they built and so and uh, had the public uh, drive them. And that was a very successful engine, uh, but the car design by that time was not by my father. Please. Okay. Right Vir Virgil, yeah. I have a little story that I think needs to be told. Okay. Uh, I hope my voice will carry well enough. It does. Yeah. You good. I, my, I'm John Samson. Yes. I was hired by yes. Virgil Senior. Yes. We're my father. Twenty some years of Chrysler yeah. styling. Mm -hmm. One day, which I remember very clearly, I think it was '59 or 1960. Uh, X came into the styling studio, and I think I was in the Plymouth studio at the time. Mm -hmm. He gathered the designers all together, and he said, the cars of the future are going to be wedge-shaped. They're right. going to be low in front, Good. and they're going to be high in the rear. And your job is going to be to find a pr attractive ways to carry the shapes and lines from a low hood back to the high deck. Right. Shortly after Mr. Engel came in, and everything went back to the old teardrop kind of high style. Yeah. What today's designs are, are to me, all wedge shaped. Wedge shaped, just You're what right. Max was talking about. Absolutely. And it was and 50 that, years that, ahead of this uh, time. I'm glad you brought that up, John, because that was important. Uh, he not only wanted the cars to look fleet, which he felt was fit the tail up there and make it look like a dart, uh, but that was part of the true aerodynamics that we have the legacy of today. Uh, was that it isn't just a fin for cross uh, wind uh, uh, stability, but the whole car is wedge shaped today because that moves the center of air pressure behind or towards at least behind the center of gravity of the whole vehicle. Thus, you see all stock car, racing cars, uh, uh, and Almost every car on the highway today has basically a slim nose and grows towards the total rear of the car. Uh, whether it has a, a notch back roof or not, the basic air pressure has been moved back to the point where at least it has a pretty good handle on the center of gravity and that makes for inherent directional stability and it all, also makes for a lower coefficient of drag. Is that uh, what you're thinking of, John? Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Virgil, what I find so interesting is the, the stuff that your father did um, in the concept cars that became uh, production cars 50 years later. I mean, there's an awful lot of the, um, what your father had done in the 300, the new Chrysler, which is so successful. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't think it's nearly as pretty as it would have been had your father done. But most importantly, in the and the concept cars, you know, it's a pretty good example right here. He did this in 1951. Yeah. If you look at the Chrysler concept cars that came out 45 years later, That's right. they look almost exactly the same. They picked up a so, lot of cues, right? Uh, and uh, and that, that's a good example. That was one of the designs that he did in 1951. Uh, you saw it in plain, simple line drawing in the uh, Stephen Center. And that became the basis for the uh, Chrysler uh, uh, Dia uh, uh, Delegates uh, automobile, uh, which became uh, plowed into, with Chrysler's permi permission, the 1955 Carmen Dia Volkswagen. And uh, I had the second one that ever came into this country and it was overjoyed. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, that, uh, that was the, 
representative philosophy of the long hood and short deck uh, with always a spare tire. You're never talking about putting a spare tire. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that to him meant automobile. And uh, so we had to live with the spare tire. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, Frank, you're right. Uh, uh, the basic design of this sort of this kind of car, especially with the front end and the establishment of the first uh, uh, the first uh, show car that was so successful, the K310 in 1951, that truly introduced the Hemi engine for the first time. Uh, that was extremely successful. And uh, it led to really the basis of today's uh, Chrysler 300 uh, front end design, at least. That's about all. Uh, he would, uh, I believe, uh, kind of have a fit about the looks of today's Chrysler 300 being so terribly slab sided and tankish. Even though it, uh, even though it may uh, represent stability and uh, toughness to some people, uh, he always believed in a far more elegant-looking uh, car that had some genuine sculpture to it uh, that uh, could just as well be in today's 300, and uh, I'm afraid is uh, quite lacking. It's a wonderful automobile, uh, just as the 300s were back in those days. He uses a Basically, a Hemi engine, uh, but uh, uh, but it is. Uh, I'm sure he would criticize uh, the proportions that it has because it's gone back to the thing that he tried to get Chrysler away from in 1949. He joined Chrysler in 1949, and they had very much a stodgy look to them. All, all well engineered. Uh, and uh, but they had a very much of a bland look to them, uh, very boxy, as you would say, and the proportions were slitty-looking windows that you wanted to open up, get more glass area to the car. Yes, it costs more money, okay, but uh, he wanted uh, to get a lower belt line and more elegance uh, overall in some softness uh, to the lines at least and uh, and there are other cars that uh, we have today that represent that uh, and I think you'll see a, a, a better handling uh, from our companies uh, in the next few years that will get away from that uh, boxiness that's been brought upon by the uh, by the uh, SUV and van buyers and truck buyers, that's a market in itself and deserves to look like those kind of tough vehicles. Uh, the car must look purposeful for the purpose it's meant for. Uh, and so uh, I'm sure we'll see the designers start to rebel against, uh, against that sort of thing and get back to uh, some elegance uh, in the style. Can I ask one more uh, question? You. Mm -hmm. uh, in seeing your design exercise uh, mm -hmm. that you did for Cadillac, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you commented to me that it was done computer free, which I. Uh, well, I did the whole thing on a computer, but one has to, I mean, I, I sketch and draw by hand first, uh, and then I scan that, and then I start with the computer to work over the lines and surfaces until I get what I want, and that's tedious. Uh, okay, you can sketch and design to begin with on, uh, uh, on the computer. I uh, haven't developed that skill yet, and uh, I trust my own drawing with a pencil uh, first, as my father would. And uh, that's a real quick, you might noodle out a real quick little sketch and just noodle it, and uh, then you start to uh, uh, elaborate on it and develop it into color and to prettiness, but then you have to always check that against the genuine engineering parameters and the considerations that you must take uh, to make it into a practical product in, in every way, just as, uh, as uh, Paul Don innovated in his, uh, in his talk this afternoon. You, you just don't make a pretty picture and think it's going to work. It has to work first and then you get the prettiness as much as you can out of it.
do you feel that the, uh, the design schools or, or the students are losing that skill set? They certainly are. Yeah, they certainly are losing a lot of touch of the of the mind to hand feel uh, in uh, in uh, a lot of not being able to draw with a pen or pencil on paper. Uh, however, I've seen Paul's department and uh, where he stresses drawing with at least a magic marker and with thick and thin lines so uh, that uh, you should. The computer will do that, but not very well. Uh, and um, so I think that uh, uh, that we are losing a lot of that if a student thinks he can just go into the computer and create a three-dimensional, for real, form product without touching and feeling and, uh, and uh, interjecting uh, all of our human senses instead of just see. Uh, I noticed that the uh, 66 dudes and birds looks a lot like the Stutz Blackhawk. There seemed to be some of them. Well, actually, it preceded the Stutz Blackhawk. Uh, it was uh, designed uh, from a series that we did for Esquire magazine uh, that was to us, it was a, a series that said, what should they look like now? And it took old uh, Duesenberg, Stutz, Mercer, and Packard, and we did our our uh, designs on what we thought they uh, might look like today. This was in 1963. And out of that uh, came uh, the actual 1966. We tried to revive the actual Duesenberg with Fritz. Of the uh, of the Stutz, which progressed from uh, 1967. Finally, the first prototype was built in 1969, and they continued on uh, building basically the Stutz Blackhawk, uh, uh, which uh, which was a, a name that uh, that uh, Andy seeded the uh, original Stutz, uh, what we call the uh, the uh, uh, Stutz Speedster, the uh, the original. Uh, Very real, good. Bearcat. 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 Bearcat, of course. And um, uh, so uh, then uh, it became the Black Hawk and, and uh, took off and they built over 400 cars on uh, General Motors uh, uh, GM uh, uh, Pontiac GTO chassis that uh, virtually they bought a car from Pontiac from, uh, from uh, John DeLorean who was at Pontiac at that time and shipped them to uh, uh, Ia in Italy, in Torino, and uh, he, uh, uh, at Ia, they simply uh, discarded the bodies and uh, built the, uh, the uh, new bodies around uh, some of the basics uh, of, the, uh, of the Pontiac GTO. The original is Saturn, though. Pardon? The Saturn. The Saturn? Yes. That, yes, that was one of the, the, uh, the um, body. Yeah, body, that's right. Yeah. No, that's right. It became, they turned it into Saturn. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk Frank's uh, uncle was extremely involved in that project. Yeah. Could you talk about uh, the, the years you worked, you and your dad worked together? Uh, well, that was between when I got out of the service. My father was uh, just about finishing up at Chrysler. He wanted to retire, and he was suddenly relieved. Uh, and uh, <coughs> to retire through a, quite a big error that wasn't really his fault. And, uh, and, uh, and we went into business together, and he had gotten hooked on power boats at that time. I had virtually no interest in power boats, and uh, we, he kind of nurtured me that way, and we decided, boy, that's fun to do, and uh, everything's got to be fun to do. And so, uh, and that as well as revival of these, uh, these cars, uh, the special cars, some of them we did for the Copper Development Association, like the Mercer Cobra uh, that you saw today, which was to promote uh, copper and brass to the automotive industry. And uh, then there was the Stutz and the uh, Duesenberg Project. And then we got involved in the Renwall model versions, the little plastic 
kit models of, uh, of each one of these cars, and we went on, and, uh, and uh, Ringwall Company in Long Island uh, produced uh, many of these kits uh, in 125th scale, uh, and uh, they were extremely successful. They hadn't been in the model car business before that. It was uh, other companies that were, and there was a scramble to uh, to get to uh, do the uh, kits, I laid out a lot of lines uh, of those cars myself, and I swiped uh, little parts and whatnot from from other car kit companies and uh, fed it to uh, Renwall, and they uh, they uh, came up with uh, with uh, injected molding uh, molded uh, plastic uh, parts, and uh, and uh, we just were flabbergasted the royalties got off of that. It was just unbelievable. It was more, more money we ever made in our lives. It wasn't much. But uh, it was fun. It was fun to work with other people, too. It was just great. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the Bugatti project? I just think that car is beautiful. Well, Mike, maybe you can tell them all about it, huh? Where are you? <laughs> okay. Uh, that was a labor of love. By about 1962, or at this time, uh, that uh, went in business with my father, we both got rehooked, you might say, on classic cars, and there was starting to be quite a movement at that time uh, to uh, on the part of collectors and restoring old cars, and especially the great classics of the 30s, and uh, uh, that included, of course, uh, Duesenberg and. Uh, and foreign makes, uh, Bugatti, Hispano Suiza, uh, uh, the great Mercedes, uh, just a, a myriad of, uh, of the great classic cars, Alfa Romeo, uh, and, uh, and uh, English cars uh, as well, uh, 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 El Chesney has one. I have no idea. <laughs> what, what is your great low slung English car? Invicta, another one, yes. Minerva. Okay, Minerva. Uh, but, pardon? Minerva's Belgian. Oh, Minerva's Belgian. You're right, Mike. Okay, you're here. Okay. Well, anyway, we got hooked on all that and. Uh, and uh, there started to be some restoration shops around us that uh, were really, uh, these guys that were uh, uh, sort of semi-retired from the motors that uh, worked in shops uh, there that could really uh, restore metal and uh, restore the cars. And, and that spurred our interest and along came um, uh, opportunity to buy several cars that Mike and I considered <laughs> and unfortunately passed on. Uh, one was a great, uh, 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 that had been the prototype of the 1927 LaSalle, actually. Uh, but um, uh, uh, we uh, discovered a, uh, or heard tell about a uh, fella that had bought 15 or 20 uh, Bugattis from the Bugatti factory when it went out of business about 1960. And uh, this was approximately 1963, 62, 63. We heard about this. Uh, I went with my father. We looked at the uh, the uh, stock of cars he had, and lo and behold, there was the last existing chassis that the true Bugatti company ever built. It was only a chassis, it never had a body on it. We thought, boy, that would be a neat project to do a modern Bugatti. Uh, up-to-date Bugatti on that last chassis, so uh, so we bought it, and then Mike and I went to uh, uh, took a station wagon that I had at that time, and uh, we uh, traipsed uh, virtually through the snow all the way down to uh, to Jersey, to uh, New Jersey, and uh, we uh, picked it up uh, and we brought it back uh, to Birmingham. Mike and I shortened the wheelbase on it, and then. Uh, my brother and I shipped it to Gia, and they built the uh, Bugatti that you saw today, the beautiful Bugatti body that my father basically designed, I did the interior for, basically. And um, we had the car for a number of years, even after I left my father, and he finally 
sold it to Tom Barrett, who was really the forerunner of the great car auctioneers in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Yeah? Virgil, if you'll speak to your father as a father, he would have when you first came home with your pen designs of the Seneca Special, mm -hmm. how did he did he uh, receive it? Or did he say, what are they teaching at that school? Or did he no, no, no. It? Yes. Oh, no, no. He always, uh, you know, looked at my stuff and criticized it properly. And uh, gave me <laughs> ideas of how I could save some money uh, here and there. And uh, But uh, I pursued uh, on my own uh, to... Uh, to do uh, basically what I wanted to do, uh, and uh, he was kind in his criticisms, and uh, when I, I knew when he felt that, that I was right about stuff, and go ahead and do it, son. Which of today's cars do you think your father would most admire? Well, I, it's a, it's a, that's a difficult question, always. Uh, uh, it's, it's, um, K310 certainly stands out in his no, I mean, mind. No, I mean the, more, the cars on the market today. Today? Yeah. Uh, that's a tough question. Uh, I appreciate all of them from the standpoint that there are far better cars than ever existed uh, during his time. Uh, he would appreciate the clean uh, simplicity of today's designs and the smaller cars to a great extent. Uh, he would... Uh, 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 be very upset by the lack of, of identity that virtually they all lack uh, any form of identity. The Chrysler 300 is, a, is an example that does have at least not only an identity with the past but a very strong identity of its own only in the front end design. Uh, but, um, and of course he contributed to that basically. But um, uh, I think that he would he would like some of the very latest um, uh, concept cars that most of you haven't seen yet. Uh, some that were just introduced uh, to the uh, in the um, Frankfurt Auto Show in Germany, and uh, the new Focus Pocket. That little version that they have of that is just a real beautiful little car, and uh, it is uh, the size of smaller even smaller European cars, smaller than the original Volkswagen, the, the Beetle that we know. Uh, but there are also some today that that have uh, a spirit of the Mitsubishi uh, and some of the Japanese designs uh, that have uh, uh, at least a little sculpture and uh, have a, a spirited look to them. Uh, I think they all do a pretty poor job of uh, headlight uh, uh, designing, uh, even though they're very built in today, which we all strove for, as well as bumper protection is built in today. And uh, that was brought about by not wanting to go with big, heavy chrome bumpers more than anything else. Uh, it was not dictated by the, uh, uh, by the uh, uh, crash with uh, five mile per hour of law in any way. We strove for that, Del Coast can tell you that, we strove for that kind of a painted look uh, to the front end and rear end long before it was uh, became a five mile per hour crash barrier test uh, and uh, for cleanliness of design and part of the aerodynamics. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's move the quest, that same question over to you. What, what designs do you like the best now? And what about the stuff that Joe Jarrell's doing at Excel Design? Uh, Duke Jarrell's been doing a beautiful job for years, of course, and stands for virtually the epitome of, uh, of Italian design today. And uh, now, yesterday, his son is doing a beautiful job. And uh, I think that uh, uh, you'll continue to see, uh, because of their innate, cultural, simple, clean design sense, I think you'll continue to see Italian design uh, practically lead the world. Now, Asian design, they have a simplicity of different culture and whatnot, but they also are deeply cultured in very simple, beautiful art. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the Japanese auto industry and uh, China uh, will become strong in design. And uh, I think it will uh, it will compete uh, with uh, uh, with the Italians, and we must be in there ourselves to be able to uh, do something about that. 
and to keep up our end of the bargain, or we may not just, we may just forget it and uh, try something else. Um, so, uh, and we might be a world market-wise a better off to do that, and let, let it up to the people who can really do it. So what's your favorite design out there that's produced today? <laughs> At any time, uh, I never can make up my mind about that. And uh, because at any time, it's, well, things are, are so equal at any time. There's, there's not much outstanding today uh, in any way uh, that you can point at and say, this is clearly as advanced uh, as my father's 57 line of cars, or even for 55. So that, that's tough to... Uh, that's really tough to answer. I'm not trying to skirt the issue. Uh, I always have ideas for the future uh, that um, that uh, I almost instantly forget today and, and go on to that rather than, than uh, uh, dawdle on, on what today looks like. It used to be much easier. It was much easier to pick out uh, uh, outstanding design. It's all gotten very close together. Now it's almost more of a of what product is actually better. What's the reality of the product? And because the designs are so close overall, they just basically all of them to a great extent lack a great deal of individual identity. Mm -hmm. To that point, presented at uh, Pebble Beach uh, concept. Yes. Yes. Have you seen that? I've seen pictures. That of is. You have. That is captivating. I haven't seen it in in flesh. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of interesting stuff there. And, uh, but he has style. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've seen. Anybody else? Yes, sir. With, with the development of relatively lightweight, uh, low cost materials. Do you ever see uh, fins coming back uh, no. for aerodynamics stability purposes? No, I really don't because, like I say, the fin is now built into the car uh, in a wedge-shaped form, uh, and it is uh, really uh, not uh, as necessary as it used to be, uh, except from a side spoiler standpoint, like on a stock car, a racing car. And uh, so uh, I don't believe that, uh, that it's going to be that necessary. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's uh, not, not certainly not a fin as we knew it in my in my father's era. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's probably uh, prudent at this point because some people may want to catch the bus which is outside and it'll deliver you where you want to go. It'll take you to Morris and that's where you're headed. It'll also take you back to your parked car. Uh, we could carry this further if, mm -hmm. if it's okay with Virgil, perhaps outside. I know the staff tonight has got a Appreciate your time, and uh, perhaps Virgil can be uh, first to find to uh, go to a local public. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't thank. Uh, listen, uh, Paul. <laughs> I can't th thank you enough for being uh, patient and uh, and uh, muddling through this whole thing and uh, for the show that we put on. I hope people liked it and uh, I hope that, uh, that Peter Fish is uh, satisfied and that all of you uh, have enjoyed it.